And then we discovered that, oh, we could even use the coal in order to drive a steam engine to do other things, like to run a train. No? So it's almost a joke of history how the steam engine and coal together started the Industrial Revolution, a very interesting thing. Now that was the Industrial Revolution, and later on, around 1950, and that is certainly relevant for Abu Dhabi and the Gulf and Saudi Arabia, now, after the Second World War, cheap oil became available globally, not just in the United States, and that started the Second Industrial Revolution. And this is, of course, tied to, you know, nuclear energy, the microchips, transistors, and so on. And this is what we have today. You have still a lot of coal, we have oil, we have gas, nuclear, and a tiny little bit of renewables. The question is how the future will look like. I mean, whatever you think about it, there's one thing for sure, it will look differently. Because of this, for example, I just did this calculation for myself for my new book, which Michelin, today we are burning in one year as much oil as was built over by geochemical processes here in the Gulf region, for example, it was built over five million years. So the expense ratio to the income ratio, if you like, is one to five, is five million to one. That is clearly not sustainable. Eh? Um, it's a little bit better with coal. We burn coal at the rate of 10,000 years equivalent every year. But for cheap oil, this is going to be depleted, clearly. That's why we are in the power scene, if you like. And this is a, just a, a paper colleagues of mine did at the Potsdam Institute. This is the petroleum resources we have in the world, you know. This is the, what has been produced already. This is the chunk available in the Middle East and Northern Africa. So this is in, uh, this is the cost curve and other conventional and then we have to go to enhanced oil recovery, deep sea, arctic oil, and so on, tar sands. Finally, it will be cold to liquid. And you see the costs will go up like this. And only this tiny little part of the curve is where our current industrial system can survive. Beyond that, you have to go into completely different techniques. You have to ha spend much more money, and certainly you will not have cheap access to conventional energy to nine billion people. Huh? So, this is the side effect, and this is probably my most important slide tonight. I don't know how often global warming has been discussed in this region here, but it is certainly very relevant, and I will show you. But this hopefully will convince you, because what we did is we calculated, this is the warming relative to pre-industrial, so you see we have about 0.8 degrees warming till today. And this is the result we will get. There are a lot of uncertainties involved, but you clearly see this fan. This is if we burn all the petroleum and so on we have here, and the result will be this type of warming. So, till the year 2100, it will be about three to four degrees, but when it goes on, it's a nonlinear system. Once you steer the climate system, oh, you have a lot of inertia, and then it will go on till about eight degrees warming. Now, this is very important now, right? because this is the best science we can give you, and eight degrees warming, global mean temperature, means over the continents a warming of maybe 11 or 12 degrees. Now just add 12 degrees centigrade to the temperature curve around the year in Abu Dhabi. So that means instead of 48 degrees peak temperature, we'd have 60 degrees. This is clearly the end of doing any outdoor activities here. <laughs> Of course, with air conditioning all year round, you could still survive. Huh? 
but there are many countries who cannot afford air conditioning all year round, and these people would just come here or to other places. So that is for me, and that's why I call it humankind at the crossroads. If we would go into that world, it simply would not provide a basis, a life support basis for nine billion people. It's impossible. It would be a completely different world. So what's the alternative? The alternative is to reduce emissions like this, actually go even to negative emissions. We can talk about that later. That would bring us to a maximum of two degrees global warming. And that is precisely what 194 countries more or less decided in Copenhagen. Instead, uh, in spite of the co collapse of the negotiations and reiterated in Durban this year, actually, just in December. So two degrees warming is the maximum which can be accepted due to political exclamation and to expression of will. But you see, in order to do that, we have to reduce our emissions from this curve to this curve. And that would, I come back to that later and I show you the, the supply curves which we have to face. Now, if we really want to avoid the red development I showed you, and you know this is not scaremongering, this is not doomsday, this is based on the best science we have. Huh? So the science tells you the inconvenient truth if we do business as usual, and of course selling oil, producing oil, coal, whatever is part of it, business as usual. We will go into a world where we cannot support a higher form of civilization. Eh? I mean, just take my words. This is not, you know, an apocalyptic uh, sort of prediction. It is just a sober analysis based on the best science we have. And probably we, we don't want to see it. Now, what can we do about it? Um, we can try to transform the energy system. And in Germany, this is the new story, if you like. Germany, after the Fukushima accident on the nuclear power plants, and I know this is an issue here in Abu Dhabi, uh, decided to completely phase out nuclear, which would be part of the solution, if you like. And this is a world energy mix calculations we did for the German government. You see, in 1970, so you had here oil, coal, and so on. In 2050, first of all, you have a lot of energy efficiency gains through electromobility, heat pumps, power generation directly from renewables. And then this mix is a completely different energy world. Now, you can debate whether this is the only option, whether there are other energy mixes. But it has clearly a, a transformational character. Now, how can it be achieved? In particular, for research and, uh, and demonstration and development. Now, the problem is that, and maybe it's the same thing here, research R&D into energy systems was always very, very marginal only. I uh, just want to show you here, this is the U.S. federal government R&D since 1955. So you see, this is space, John F. Kennedy's Apollo program, took a huge chunk. Then there was a tiny little bit on energy boost uh, by Jimmy Carter, renewables, after the oil price shocks, of course, once OPEC was established. Yeah. And then it has shrunk to an insignificant part. And this is all about security, homeland security, and so on. So you see, the energy future of the world is just a tiny little part of the R&D portfolio in the United States, still. But if you want to win the future, we have to change our way here, clearly. Now, i skip that. Now, the interesting thing is, if you really invest R&D into, say, renewable energy sources, now this is the learning curve thing, which you probably know from semiconductor devices, things like that. We talked about that just uh, that uh, Abu Dhabi is going to be uh, a major site for producing 
uh, semiconductor devices, for example, or that's the plan at least. Uh, and you know you have always this learning curve. So now these are double logarithmic curves. So in the end, if you have an exponential learning, and that's, that is a straight line. And you can calculate that photovoltaic, biomass, wind, solar thermal, and so on, will cross with the right investment fairly soon the conventional power supply. So that is something we have seen in Germany, for example, over the last years. So it can be done. Um, and I show you more or less, and that's what we discussed with all the Nobel laureates in Stockholm. The idea is that, that our industry all over the world is driven, of course, by fossil fuels, by nuclear power, and this is the best of all possible worlds. So, and in a sense it is true, and this is the paradigm, so to speak, we are sitting in a, in a deep valley. This is the minimum of cost, that is the current system. The problem with that is, if you in factor in all the external costs, what the economists call the externalities, uh, like climate change, for example, if you factor that in, the costs are raised to a much higher level. But even more interesting is that there is a world outside that cost valley, and actually it's an even better system here. And that would be driven in the end by renewable energies. Uh, I mean, you can do all the calculations. The problem is to get from here to here because you have to climb a hill in between. So that means you have to invest, you have a lot of upfront investment. So if Abu Dhabi would switch from fossil fuels and nuclear directly into renewables, there are a number of costs involved, clearly. In the beginning, it would have, you have to raise energy prices and so on. Afterwards, then of course, everything would become much cheaper. Now, the problem is that through subsidies and so on, you deeper, you sort of create an even steeper hill, so you, it's very hard to go over that hill, but through the right investment R&D, you could actually make this landscape much flatter. So you internalize the costs here, and through R&D you make this hill much flatter, and in the end this would happen, so to speak. Now this is how technology will save the world, in a cartoon, if you like. Uh. Now this involves, of course, millions of dimensions uh, of technological development, economic development, social development, and so on. But that's the big picture, so to speak. Now uh, I'll show you what will be involved in that transformation, and that is relevant for the Middle East and Northern Africa. You know, there is a huge project now done in the European Union which plans to set up what we call a super smart grid. So it's high voltage transmission lines, things like that, to connect all the renewable power sources, if you like, in Europe and in Northern Africa in particular. But I think the Middle East could be involved. And that is called Desertec project. Eh? It is already up and running and with a lot of investment. We tried to build, in particular in Germany, a very prototype houses, what we call powerhouses, houses which create more energy than they consume. And the excess, excess energy is fed into the national grid. Um, you have clearly a different type of mobility. It's not just using, uh, replacing the combustion engine by an electric engine, but we're also setting up an entire system, a modular system of transport. So you deliver mobility instead of a car. It's very important. Eh? So you can move freely within an urban environment. It's what we call cradle to cradle. And I think it's the idea of recycling. Whatever you manufacture, will be the starting point of a new product, so to speak, instead of just throwing it away. So whenever you create a product, you already think about how you would use it in a different product. 
And we have two other things here, or three other things. It's urban planning. Now, master city is clearly an interesting example how you create a sustainable city. It is what are you going to do with the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere? And here, carbon capture and storage plays an important role. And finally, I think what's very important for this region here, it's the desalination of water, which costs a lot of energy. But it could be driven in principle by renewable energy, in particular solar energy, if you make the right investment. Huh? And that would be a sustainable solution for, for many regions. OK. Uh, I should mention that I'm the chair of the governing board of the European Institute for Innovation and Technology on climate change. And these are the major uh, technical universities. And I guess that's very interesting for Khalifa as well. So it is Imperial College in London, which is the foremost engineering capacity. It is the uh, ETH in Zurich here. It is the Technical University of Berlin, my own institute. It is uh, Paris Tech in Paris. And uh, we also have in the Netherlands uh, the, the leading technical university, namely Delft University. And we all look into these innovations. Now, I don't know whether you have heard about it at all, but some of you may have heard it. But people say, OK, doing all this technological transformation work eh, in renewables in other places, carbon capture and storage and things like that. It can't be done. Uh, it's too costly. Society will not follow and so on. So, but we admit that global change is a really big problem. I mean, just recall my slide on the eight degrees warming. I mean, nobody would like to see our planet moving into that danger zone. Eh? So the idea came up, and in, in particular in the United States, but also in other places, couldn't we, in a sense, shoot down global warming? So if we have more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, couldn't we do solar radiation management? And the idea is the following one. For example, you could send rockets to the stratosphere, and these rockets are laden with sulfur dioxide. Sulfur dioxide will just dim the sunlight. That's what is happening if, I'm, if you have a major volcano eruption. You can even measure that. Uh, after, the, after a volcano eruption, you can have a year without summer because the sunlight is shielded, shielded off. Now, couldn't we do it artificially? And that's the idea. So we keep on burning CO2 and so on, fossil fuels, but we will send rockets to the stratosphere to shield off the sunlight. Now, that sounds like an interesting idea, and actually it was created um, through the people who did, or who were the protagonists of the Manhattan Project. You know, the Manhattan Project delivered in the end, in 1945, the atomic bomb, that was also the basis for the civil use of, 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 of nuclear energy in the end. and. The two people who were instrumental, but also thought about applications to the atmosphere were these two people. That's really interesting to talk about them. I mean, probably, them, as uh, was mentioned before, I'm, I'm happy to use one of Albert Einstein's former offices in Potsdam, which is a great ins uh, inspiration, of course. But probably the smartest man of the 20th century was not Albert Einstein, but this guy here, John von Neumann. Absolutely incredible mind. You know, and I could tell you for the whole evening stories about John von Neumann. Really amazing person. He actually invented the personal computer architecture. He did he invented game theory. He laid the foundations for quantum theory. He invented many numerical algorithms for solving nasty equations. And he was the absolute pioneer of numerical weather forecasting at the uh, Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton, where Freeman Dyson is still uh, hovering around. Because uh, Dyson is a very interesting character. 
And uh, so John von Neumann was absolutely unique. Now this is Edward Teller who was instrumental in the Manhattan Project, but also was called more or less the father of the hydrogen bomb later on. And these two people thought that in the arms race with the Soviet Union, it is absolutely important to understand how the climate system works. Why? Because we thought this could be a weapon to be used against the Soviet Union. We thought if you understand how weather and climate works, you can turn it into a manipulation of the weather and you could create a sort of misharvests in the Soviet Union by simply cutting off the precipitation during the summer. Eh? So that was really the plan. Eh? Um, so in the 1950s you had fantasies like this, you know, weather made to order. So this is a very interesting uh, channel at that time. And today we have this here. Now, this is not science fiction, really. You have a, n a number of really respected scientists at Harvard, at Columbia University, and so on, who go into that field, namely, we alpha do this. For example, we create a lot of sprays, maybe in the Gulf region, in order to have additional clouds to shield off the sunlight. Eh? Of course, you would need probably a million of these instruments here in order to cool down the planet. That would cost a lot of energy, clearly, to do it. Or you send rockets to the stratosphere, things like that. Or the other thing, and it's called solar radiation management. Eh? There are already a number of private companies who go into that field and think we will make a fortune with it. And the other are thinking of creating these fans here where you suck up the CO2 from the air with chemical precipitation methods and so on. Eh? Now, I just wrote a paper about that, uh, reviewing all these, um, and you can read it in the proceeding of the National Academy of Sciences. Uh, I call it, the title is Geoengineering the Good, the Mad, and the Sensible. And it just shows you that the costs of, for example, removing one ton of CO2 from the atmosphere would be at least $1,000. So if you calculate that you have to remove about 10 billion tons per year in order to keep the climate stable, just multiply 10 billion by 1,000, it's 10 trillion per year. That's quite a bill. For that you can invest in just about anything. Eh? So this is certainly a dead end street, but people do believe that has to be pursued. So that is the Manhattan Project. So engineering is extremely important, as Freeman Dyson also said about technology, but geoengineering is probably a red herring. Now I talked about Albert Einstein before. You know, Albert Einstein was not as smart as John von Neumann, but he was a genius, a true genius, and he changed the world of natural science. So, so actually in the institute where I'm based now, I'm not just using a former office, but also in the basement, for some of you may have heard about the Michelson experiment, that showed for the first time that uh, the velocity of light does not depend on the velocity of the source. And that gave birth to the relativity theory. Yeah? And we still have the original instrument, and it's really you know, awesome to go there and to look at it. It was done in 1881. Now, Albert Einstein, together with Bertrand Russell, and if you are a philosopher, you know about Bertrand Russell, um, he, in 1955, published together with a number of prestigious colleagues the Russell Einstein Manifesto against the nuclear arms race. And this is a similar situation we have today. So when I entered physics and mathematics, I never dreamed of becoming a public intellectual talking about climate change and energy system transformation. I just wanted to be a good 
a quantum theorist and later on a complex systems person. Huh? So I was one of the pioneers looking into fractal structures and things like that. But through my sort of try and error path into uh, climate change, I discovered that we have a story to tell and is as powerful and important as the story Albert Einstein and Bertrand Russell told the world at the height of the arms race. Because it was absolutely possible to destroy the world by a nuclear uh, shootout. Huh? And later on, people did what we call nuclear winter studies. So if just a tiny part of all the nuclear weaponry would have been exchanged, it would have completely destroyed the world's climate for a decade or so. So that is, uh, uh, but here the interesting thing is, uh, you can directly translate it into climate issue. You know, many warnings have, that was about the, the threat by nuclear bombs. Many warnings have been uttered by eminent men of science and so on. By the way, at that time there were no women in science, as you can see. That has changed now. We have found that the men who know most are the most gloomy about. So, what we have to do now is really tell politicians the inconvenient truth about climate change. Al Gore has tried to do that. He's not a scientist. Now, Al Gore is an interesting personality because he always loved mathematics and physics, but he never understood it. Eh? So when he went to Harvard, he took a course in oceanography by Roger Rebell, who is one of the founding fathers of climate science. Uh, and he was, he, I mean, he was absolutely enthusiastic about that, but he was always a poor math person, Al Gore, and that is probably the tragedy of his life. On the other hand, he won the Peace Nobel Prize and the Oscar and so on. But anyway, um, the inconvenient truth is now the following, and uh, it's, I can tell you in just two slides. Uh, and we did a study for the German government, uh, and I sort of explained that to Chancellor Merkel in detail because she understands the formula and so on. Uh, this is the following thing. Now, bear with me for a minute because that's the only formula I'm going to show. It's a very simple one in the end. It's a very powerful one. We discovered that, and these are sort of the models and the data we have.